I'm going to give you an overview of why this climate change challenge is so complex and why we really need a multidisciplinary approach. So climate change is a particularly wicked problem. When we, when we say uh, wicked problems, we're really talking about problems that are very intractable. And when I talk about climate change, I like to use an a, analogy, a, a veterinary analogy, to, to give people a sense of really why this is such an intractable problem. So I like to use the analogy that we're, we're talking about treating this big, sick elephant, and we only have a few blind doctors to do it. Running with the analogy, we, we, I like to talk about this is uh, a disease that is really slow moving and oftentimes uh, the symptoms that uh, we see are hard to distinguish from symptoms of other diseases. And treating some of these symptoms really actually might worsen the disease. And finally, and finally, it's not just one elephant that's sick, we've got a whole other range of problems to deal with. So as a, as a soil scientist, uh, an agroecologist, I'm able to work with farmers on one particular issue that's affecting farmers in terms of climate change. But in fact, I'm just getting one small glimpse of what's impacting the farm operation. So when we're working uh, on farm, doing applied research with farmers, I'm seeing an important component of what's happening, but there are many other uh, problems that are being brought on by climate change at the same time. Something that would be um, very different to uh, an economist or a social scientist or even another biophysical scientist, someone who's uh, looking at the weed population of the farm. One of the major challenges that I see with climate change is that it really is a slow moving beast. That when you ask farmers whether or not they see impacts uh, of climate change already, some of them say that they have, some of them say that they have not. Many of them don't actually believe the science that is clearly indicating that increases in uh, fossil fuel emissions is going to present huge challenges for their future. So it's really hard to convince farmers that this is a problem that needs to be addressed if they don't believe in the science. And part of that disbelief is the uncertainty. So we know that our models aren't totally perfect. We also know that there are a bunch of different scenarios for our future. And in this graph, we're, uh, we're we're seeing very different potential futures. The arrow is indicating the 1.5 degree temperature that most climate scientists uh, point to as sort of the threshold for a safe operating space for humanity. And the different colors in this graph are illustrating the different trajectories of, uh, of temperature. And those temperature trajectories really depend on a bunch of different choices. Basically, how much CO2 are, are we going to pump into the atmosphere over the next 50 to 100 years? So along with this uncertainty, farmers are faced with the, the fact that there are many different potential futures. And the big challenge that, that I see is uh, convincing farmers that we really need to be preparing for the worst situation, but working towards the best. And that, for many farmers, is challenging because, as we discussed earlier, having uh, a choice of a major infrastructure investment is something that's going to be, uh, be a, a challenging, uh, a very difficult choice to make without some clear evidence that it's going to be beneficial. And finally, farmers are, have always dealt with uh, inclement weather. The weather has always been shifting in terms of its patterns and its volatility. So it's, it's hard for farmers to distinguish how this is going to be different from what they've already faced. And it's clear from the models that, you know, once we reach that 1.5 degree uh, threshold, 
that for some farmers in the world, things are going to get a lot worse. So here in this region, with the farmers that I work with, some of them recognize the precipitation patterns have already started shifting. But we also have projections that illustrate that going forward, uh, precipitation is likely to increase both in the spring and the fall, somewhere between 4 to 12 percent in the spring, between 5 and almost 15 percent in the fall by 2030. So it's really important that as scientists, we not only try to address the problem that's, uh, that farmers are facing now, but really be forward thinking and be able to provide farmers with input on how to change their management with the future in mind. So we've done some modeling of, of uh, drainage that would deal with this shifting precipitation pattern that we see in the, the Delta region. And what we've done is utilized data that we've collected on, on farm and then used uh, ecosystem process models to project how, uh, how precipitation is likely to, to impact, in this, in this case, soils. So our, our models are, are, are working fairly robustly. So what we're showing is that over time, uh, things are going to change in terms of precipitation. So in, the, in this model we're depicting, in this graph we're depicting the results of our model that shows the precipitation that we saw in 2016 and projected precipitation in 2030 and then the water holding capacity of the soil. Basically we're trying to interpret if we have tile at 30 foot spacing, how many workable days will we actually end up having? So we calculated the, the number of workable days for 2030 and 2016 from this model. And then we did the same thing for 15-foot tile spacing, calculating the same uh, number of workable days uh, with a, a much tighter tile spacing. And what our model showed clearly is that if we were to, to project out um, if we were to look at the number of, of workable days that we'd have based on different tile spacing, say 15, 30, 60, 90, and uh, without any drainage. Um, so in this graph, we're, we're illustrating the number of workable days here for the 2016 amount of precipitation we saw for 15, 30, 60, 90, and no drained fields. Then if we take that, that modeling uh, outcome and look at what our projected precipitation is for 2030, we see that the number of workable days drops dramatically. And in fact, to have the same number of workable days as uh, a field with no drainage in 2016, we have to install drainage at, at 15 foot spacing. So this is a, a, a really important outcome that Although the models are, are, uh, aren't necessarily providing us a lot of certainty, this provides us with some sense of what the value of uh, this major drainage investment would be. So what farmers really are looking for, though, is some type of cost-benefit analysis. And this is well outside of uh, the capabilities of my lab, but we developed some rudimentary cost-benefit analysis to be able to uh, enable farmers to estimate, based on these models, what the, the cost would be for installing drainage that would actually improve their, uh, their workability going into the future. But what's really important is to, to recognize that one solution might actually be a problem in another in another way or exasperate the problem. So, you know, going back to our, our veterinary analogy, treating some symptoms might actually worsen the disease. So it's important to recognize that soil organic matter is really a key component in improving drainage. When we install tile drains, these little blue circles, we help to, to pull water out of the, the soil profile. At the same time, we, we uh, we oxygenate the soil, and that oxygen enables the microbes in the soil to, to utilize that and respire it. So over time, we might uh, improve 
certain soil qualities, like in, we could decrease the amount of salinity that's in the soil through this drainage uh, enhancement. We could actually be reducing the bulk density of the soil, but at the same time, we might be reducing the soil organic matter, the soil organic carbon, which causes an important negative feedback loop. And it also could potentially increase greenhouse gas emissions. So what we need to be aware of is that when we're looking at adaptation strategies, we need to be thinking of uh, the potential trade-offs. So there might be uh, adaptation strategies that are clearly beneficial. And in this graph, we're illustrating how we want to be able to take a farm from a place where it's, uh, it's not mitigating climate change, it's not adapting to climate change, to a place where it's doing both adaptation and mitigation. But it's certainly possible that, for example, if we installed tile drain, that we could be improving the adaptation, but actually worsening its mitigation capacity. So uh, when we did an analysis of the soil across the region in Delta, we actually showed some indication that in both blueberry and vegetable fields, at the lower depths, drainage is actually reducing uh, uh, the amount of soil organic carbon. So these values aren't statistically different. And what we're, we're, we're going to do is come back in another five years to see how these, these, uh, these numbers change. It's also important to recognize that it's not just this one farm field, this one elephant that's sick. Addressing the problem at the field level actually may not do anything if we don't address larger um, system-based problems. Uh, this map is indicating the intricate network of drainage channels that run throughout the Fraser Valley. A farmer might do, uh, uh, might install uh, drainage tile to improve their uh, their workable days on a number of their fields, but without adequate uh, drainage outside of their field connected to this system, whatever they do on the field is actually not going to enhance their, their workable days. There are a number of other issues that impact farmers at the same time as things like shifting precipitation patterns. So when we think about um, how to help farmers adapt, we have to be considering uh, some of the other policies that impact something like uh, land use. So for example, uh, farmland in, in Delta is some of the, uh, the most valuable in, uh, in the province in the country. And this is a, a, an image of 2012 and then an image taken from last year. So these types of land pressures are really impacting the farmer's ability to, uh, to run their operations, particularly when we're talking about networks of, of something like drainage systems. Furthermore, it's really important to understand that the farmer, no matter where they are in the world, is not acting in isolation. So what happens to farmers in other parts of the world are likely to affect markets. They're likely, likely to affect availability of products. And this, in turn, has a feedback on the farmers elsewhere throughout the world. We clearly saw that this, uh, this interconnectedness of farmers in the food system uh, can have important ramifications that are almost immediate. In 2008, we saw a spike in energy prices in turn, we saw a spike in fertilizer prices, spike in food prices, and this, this dramatically changed the way food moved around the world. So thinking about the farm field to the region to uh, the globe is, is, is really critical if we're trying to, uh, to provide farmers with adaptation strategies. So to summarize some of the, the challenges of climate change and to, to highlight why it is such an intractable challenge, we really need to, to have an interdisciplinary approach to effectively address the problem. We can't, there, there, there's not one particular discipline that's able to, to provide farmers with, the adequate, with adequate information. And we need to be able to address these problems, not just for what's happening now, but we need to be able to project 
uh, what's going to happen in the future so that the, 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 the challenges that farmers are, are facing now are being addressed and are actually enhancing their capability going forward. We also need to keep in mind that there may be potential trade-offs, so we don't want to solve one problem only to exasperate another one, or to, in particular, to, to contribute further to climate change. And we want to be able to look for synergies, places where we can do things like enhance adaptation and mitigation at the same time. And then we really need to be cognizant of the entire system. We need to be able to, to provide farmers with, um, with comprehensive strategies for dealing with the challenges, not just at a farm level, but with a, a regional systems and a global systems understanding.